So you are good now morning. Ready. Yeah. Thank you for joining us at this UK film webinar. My name is Wendy Mitchell. I'm a journalist and film festival consultant, and I'll be your moderator today. It's great to see so many people joining us in the audience. Um, I see people are still entering the room, so I'll talk slowly. Um, as you might know, we're doing a series of four webinars uh, this week, and today's is about co-production. Uh, I think we've got a great panel of international experts, and it really is a hot topic because it seems during this crazy COVID time, like national borders are coming back in, in a way. And, um, you know, how do you do an international collaboration if you can't even leave your house? So um, I think the experts are going to tell us why it's possible, why it's still important. Um, and I'd like to remind everybody that you can use the Q&A button uh, throughout our talk, and we'll keep an eye on that and ask questions as we have time. Um, the chat stream is not open, but you can ask a question using the Q&A button anytime for any of us. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our panel today. Um, We'll start with Fanola Dwyer, who is partner and co-owner of Wild Gaze Films. You will know her from such amazing films as Brooklyn, Their Finest, and Dirt Music. So thanks for joining us, Fanola. We have Mike Goodridge, um, the former CEO of Protagonist Pictures, my former boss at Screen International. Um, I'm not holding that against him. Uh, he's now a producer. And he is executive producer on Ruben Ostlund's Triangle of Sadness, which is shooting this summer. Uh, you might also know he runs the Macau International Film Festival. Um, I think somebody's got... Ah, he's not on mute. I think, Jeremy, are you not on mute? Um, okay, well, that'll hopefully background noise will end. Sorry to interrupt. Um, all the way from New Zealand, staying up late, thank you, is Matthew Metcalf, who is producer at GFC Films, and his credits include thank Capital in the 21st Michael Century, McLaren, Seven Days, and the TV series The Deadlands. Um, from the Netherlands, we have Marlene Slot. She's producer at Viking Film, and also co-owner of an animation studio called Holy Motion, which, hey, very smart to be involved in animation these days. Uh, she was a producer of Dirty God, Neon Bull, Royo, and many other films. We have Claudia Steffen, who is producer and managing director at Pandora Film Production in Germany. Her films include In My Room, High Life, and Monos. Great films. Uh, last but not least, we have Victoria Thomas, who is a UK producer and writer. She's worked across fiction and nonfiction. Um, one recent feature documentary she worked on is the hip hop story, Born in New York, Raised in Paris. Um, and she's got a very busy international slate, so she'll tell us more about that. Uh, if I can, I'd like to start with Finola. Um, so how are you finding it working on existing projects right now or trying to set up anything new, especially those that cross borders? Does it feel business as usual in setting things up? Obviously, nobody's shooting right now, but what's it been like? Um, I don't think anybody, you know, really could truthfully say it's been business as usual for the past. I think this is week 15 at home. So... I think most people, excuse my French, have described it like it's a head fuck, really. I mean, you have good days and bad days, and that's, you know, and I find when you talk to the Americans, they're always so relieved when you say that because it's, it's kind of great for everybody to just, like, be honest about it. It's been, it's like this invisible plague, and nobody's had any idea. And we, we still don't know to a certain extent what the future holds, but it feels like we're moving into a kind of more you know, manageable, you know, phase where things are definitely going to be possible. And obviously in countries like New Zealand, um, it's pretty much gone. And so you could go down to New Zealand, for example, and shoot in the normal way. Um, and Australia is hoping to move towards that. And some countries in Europe um, are like that as well. So, yeah, it's definitely, you know, I think it's just, it's been a bit day by day. We've been very much concentrating on... Um, you know, pushing our developments along, so spending a lot of time with the writers, which is, and actually everybody's got so much more time for that in a way. But I think everybody's also found it quite hard to concentrate. So, um, you know, I'm sure there are exceptions, but most people, you know, it's not, you don't kind of look back and go, what an amazingly productive time. Um, 
and you kind of, you know, no one knew you were going to be stuck at home for months on end. But yeah, I think we've got one at Cornby project, which is, you know, complicated and we're definitely, it's shooting, you know, America, we were, we were already before this pandemic happened, looking at Canada, it's got a lot of complex elements. So that will, you know, we've naturally just pushed that one back. We've got a Francis Lee that he's um, writing at the moment that's quite contained. Um, and we'll probably, you know, potentially do both those as co-productions. So I think just we're, we're doing proof of concepts on the Nick Hornby, storyboarding, you know, like this, we're doing everything we can do in, in the meantime, you know. Great, sorry, we're just sorting out a little tech issue. I think it's fixed. Um, can you see us, can you see the speakers now, I hope? Um, okay, we'll forge ahead. Uh, thank you, Fanola, for that. And thank you for being honest that it's not business as usual. Um, you know, are there anything new that you're, you're trying to set up right now? Does it feel like it's a time where you can, you know, pull together financing for something new or are people sort of saying, come back in a few months or? I think we, possible? look, I think we're, you know, we were conscious of this before the pandemic came, but a lot of our projects are not based here in the UK and obviously, you know, I think if you've got UK based projects and if you've got something that's quite containable, I think you can probably get up and running, you know, relatively soon because there's always risks associated with any film and, you know, but I think being smart about it and, you know, sort of mask, visors, gloves for a lot of the crew. I think there's just ways that you can actually mitigate the risk quite, you know, um, quite well, but if it's really contained and then the big studio movies are doing bubbles. So, I think rather than us throwing everything up in the air and chasing something, we're just pretty much sticking to what we're doing. You know, I think it's just like holding a nerve and just, you know, keep keep on going. But keeping an eye out for stuff that we could do here that's more contained because I think, you know, the this virus is going to be with us, you know, for a while. So, mm. um, yeah, we're sort of looking at other stuff as well. But not just kind of going... Oh, leave all that behind because they're, they're great they're great stories they're great projects and we'll, we'll, fi we'll figure out a way to get them made I mean as producers that's what we do we solve problems and figure out ways to do things and we're often you know we often shoot in like you know extreme conditions and all, all sorts of things you know um, and there's many things insurance actually never covers anyway um, so yeah you just it's it's really that's what we do we're problem solvers so you know you have to find a way through Great. Um, yeah, producers, hats off to you. You make things happen, pandemic or just regular problems, I think. Um, and for all of, maybe this is a, a kind of base, basic, stupid question, but you know, you can't be in Cannes meeting up with your French co-producers, or you can't fly to LA to meet, you know, your American partners. Um, are you just doing like everybody else? Is it just Zoom meetings and, and calls and that's yeah, how you're thinking? A lot more, a lot more Zooms actually actually and just reaching out quite early on I sort of thought oh well I'm going to like speak to a couple of people a week you know mainly you know in the states that are just um you know agents or managers or, or talent that I you know like have good relationships with and just you know treat the fat see how they're doing check on in and and that's been great actually because I think you sort of feed off each other and what have you been reading other than the kind of horrendous news, which is probably, you know, I couldn't read any fiction other than my own projects for <laughs> weeks, but fortunately I've broken that. But yeah, the, the sort of diet of um, New York Times and everything can, can get a bit overwhelming. So yeah, and, and swapping what you've been watching and yeah, so it's been kind of great actually. And I think there's a great sense of community as well. And I hope as we get back to work and, you know, the indie films and the studio films, you know, hopefully people will share, um, you know, what the experience is like and kind of, yeah, learn from it and pass it on so that we can all kind of, you know, benefit from that. That would be a really cool thing. Great. You're keeping positive. I like it. Good spirit. Um, let's go to our next positive guy, who is going to be Mike Goodridge. Um, so Mike, uh, on paper, Triangle of Sadness, um, which is of course uh, directed by the Swedish filmmaker Ruben Osmond. Um, it's set partially in Greece. Uh, it doesn't look like a natural project that would have any UK involvement, um, but yet you, you're involved, BBC Films, you got BBC Films and the BFI on board. So yeah, how did that all come about and 
become a UK co-production? Well, it's Triangle of Sadness is, is really an, a, a massive independent production. I, I look at it as a masterpiece of European financing, but that also, also is reflected in its story, which is neither... It's set on a, 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 a cruise liner, really, and it's set in the world of fashion, and then it's set on a desert island. Um, so it's not a particularly Swedish film in the sense that it doesn't take place in Sweden. It, it, it doesn't take place anywhere, and it's got so many international elements. It's in the English language. It's Ruben's first film in English. Uh, the lead actor in the film, Harris Dickinson, who's the lead character, is, um, is English, um, and is speaking in an English accent. Um, so it seemed natural that we wanted to involve the UK. And, and, you know, was it easy to get BBC, BFI on board? Was that you who did that or they brought you in? How did that work? I mean, I'm, I'm partnered with this with um, Philippe Bobert, who is um, a wonderful French, France-based producer whose who's experience in putting together European co-productions is is extraordinary. And I'm kind of in awe of the fact that there are so many players involved in this film, which is, which is budgeted just under 13 million euros. So it's a big one for, for European cinema. Um, so Philippe and I have, have partnered in a company in the UK. Um, and that was what we used to, to, to take the project to, to the funders here. And we should mention just so he stays friends with us, that the lead producer is Eric Hemmendorf at Platform. Well, yeah, and actually, when you were talking to Fanola, you know, talk about resourceful. I mean, Eric is is so brilliant in what in how he's how he's handled the situation because we were we were about thirty seven percent shot when we had to shut down, um, and Eric and Ruben actually have have just taken the bull by the horns and they haven't stopped to get this film made. So yeah, it's shot um, in its part in Sweden, and it was almost done with what it was supposed to do there. Yeah, the scenes in the the shooting leg in Sweden, um, which was in Trollhattan Studios, was almost done. Um, we still have a week to go there, um, and then we'll be moving to Greece later in the year. Yes, I'm just a little upset. My set visit, <laughs> sorry, the Greek <laughs> island is not happening, but. Um, it does sound like they're going to be able to quite soon shoot safely in Greece. Is that what you're thinking? Yes, both Sweden, Sweden's already begun shooting um, TV and film, uh -huh. and we are hoping to shoot in Sweden later this month, the remaining few days there. And then Greece is in good shape, actually, and has been throughout the, throughout the, the COVID crisis. So um, we're looking to, to shoot that um, in the third quarter. Okay. And does the COVID situation, either the pausing of the shoot or new measures, um, testing, whatever, is that going to push the budget up even more? And if so, who pays for that? Yes. I mean, there has been, um, this is where Ruben got resourceful because, you know, you have to, you have to change the way that you're going to make the film, basically. Um, apart from the fact you have to restart um, pre-production, which um, has been, is a costly process. So um, yes, there has been a, a, a considerable uptick in the budget, which was unexpected, but there are so many public partners on this project that have been supportive and that are being supportive, um, as, as are our private equity, actually, our bond company, our, um, our bank. Um, you know, nobody's doing this deliberately. So I think everybody's trying to pull together to get the best possible result. But I mean, if, you know, Eric, really has, has been driving this. Um, and it is really up to the producer to make these, these films happen, the ones that have stalled midway through their shoots. Yeah. Um, I wasn't even gonna put you under this spotlight, but we've had a question come in about insurance. I mean, have you been dealing with the insurance side of things or has that been Eric? I haven't, that was, that was um, Eric through Sweden, but we did have COVID insurance oh. um, on the project, so you know, Whatever that means. Okay, well done. Um, Thank you. Yeah, this is not an insurance seminar, and I don't think I would understand all of it anyway. But uh, good to hear that things are ticking over. Um, are you also? I mean, there are, sorry, there are so many unexpected things that can happen, like actors who can't fly, older actors who might be um, who might be vulnerable. Um, you know, agents really um, aggressively trying to bring their actors off the shoot. You know, so it's been a it's been a whirlwind. But you know calm heads have prevailed. Good. Um, and 
is it calm with everything else? I mean, you're you're a producer with a, a slate of other films. You know, are you? Does it feel like you can be really active in setting up new projects right now, or is it? I've been incredibly productive, but it's mainly in the development phases. Um, writers, I mean, I find writers are the busiest of everybody, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been, I, I haven't stopped actually in the, in the whole time. Um, so it's been kind of, um, it's, been, it's been intense um, and it continues to be so. The Zoom, of course, being the main um, organ through which you're, you're functioning. Um, but, you know, I, fi I find it very productive and, you know, obviously I think, you know, we're, we're all hoping for a time when we can start shooting again. Yes, good luck. Um, <laughs> uh, so, Mike, we'll come back to you when we have some questions at the end, I think. But um, I'd like to go on to Matthew. Um, and once again, thank you so much for staying up. Maybe it's not quite bedtime yet, but it's still after working hours. So we really appreciate you joining us. Um, I'm just curious what cross-border projects you're working on right now and how are you keeping those going during this strange pandemic year? Look, it's a really good question. Um, to be honest, I've spent an awful lot of time um, in the last few months being thankful for ironically how much time I've spent in aeroplanes. Um, in a time of Zoom, it's been the ability to reach out to people, especially in the UK, in Los Angeles, New York, whom over the last 15, 20 years I've got to know really well. And that's enabled us to effectively keep going. Um, combined with the fact that New Zealand took a unique approach uh, to COVID and now, as most, I'm sure most of the world knows, we, we are effectively out of it now. Uh, we are business as usual here. And I, I go to work every day in my office and so does everyone else. Um, so we're able to, we've been able to continue um, relatively unscathed. Um, lots of work. Um, everything seems infinitely more difficult than it once was. Um, but fundamentally, I'm very thankful for those relationships. And there's the irony, isn't it, in, in the co-production of this all, in that we lean on co-productions now because we can't travel, but the irony of it is is that those relationships were built by traveling. Um, I'm very glad I've done a lot of it in the past. Yeah, because I, I think, I think that human too. connection, you know, somebody's already asking, well, like, how are you finding this virtual Marche? Um, and no offense to the Marche, but it's not the same as having a long dinner at uh, Pastis or something, um, you know, with a potential new co-producer and really getting to know them. Yes, you could have a business meeting, um, but are you missing, like you said, you're grateful to not have to be flying all the time, but are you missing some of that human connection to set things up? Look, um, of, of course, but it's been a different kind of human connection. I've had conversations with people that I've known for 15 years in the last few weeks, in the last few months, we've talked about things we never would have before, you know. We've asked about our children. We've asked about paying mortgages, renovating homes, mowing lawns, you know. We've, I've really got to know people on a different level. And like all business, it's important to make sure that you care about the outcome of your partners as much as you care about your own outcome. And so we've really been able to advance things by saying, hey, it sounds like it's really tricky in London or New York or Los Angeles. What would work for you? Um, what kind of opportunities are you looking for? What, what limitations do you have? What, what would you like to see achieved? We've received really honest answers. And as a result, we've been able to get things happening. Um, but again, it's because of those previous relationships. Yeah, wonderful. Good to hear that positive spin. And yeah, we maybe are even talking to people we didn't talk to before. I am sometimes. Um, how do you think this year or when things get back to normal, if they do, um, whatever the new normal is, uh, how do you think we can encourage more collaboration between the UK and New Zealand in particular? Great film look, industry, done, places, English language. Look, I've done so many co-productions with the UK and I always say to people, it is the, the easiest co-production in the world, in my opinion, is New Zealand, UK. Uh, our legal systems are virtually identical. Our social systems are very, very similar, culturally very similar. And for example, even though Australia is our immediate neighbor, it's easier to do a co-production with England than Australia. 
they just naturally fit together. Um, you know, for example, the biggest market for British films outside of the UK by head of population is actually New Zealand. You know, New Zealanders love British films. Um, you know, so it, it is a natural collaborating partner. Um, the systems slot in well together. Um, uh, I encourage everyone to do it. I think of, of all the partners that you can work between, those two really work well. Gosh, we didn't even pay you to say that. That was completely organic answer, um, but I love to hear it. And because we know some systems fit together better than others, and that's and it can be a lot of the legalities. So that's wonderful to hear. Look, I, I won't name any other countries. I've done many co-productions with many countries, and there's many a times, and because I can know I can be seen, I've gone like this. Oh, if only it was the UK. Um, you know, it, it's it's a it's a good balance. The treaties do work very well together. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go now to Victoria, if I can. And Victoria, your slate is very, very international. And can you tell us a bit about what you're working on now and with what countries and if you're able to move forward with all of this while this pandemic is going on? I have been, <coughs> sorry, I have been very lucky because I am in post-production and advanced development. So there's nothing actually in production that was affected. And on the documentary, um, Born in New York, Raised in Paris, because we're dealing with music and lots of archives, we've spent the, and, and we're also dealing with a culture that's not particularly well catalogued. We spent the better of the past year sort of chasing rights holders. And now we find that people are so much more willing and quick to answer their emails. <laughs> but of course, that documentary is dealing with how hip hop has empowered kids in France to protest police brutality. And just when we think we're done, we probably have one of the biggest police brutality, <laughs> anti-police brutality movements going on. So now, but also it's in the middle of a pandemic, so we can't just really send people to um, film the um, protests in Paris or anything like that. So we're now sort of looking at that narrative to see whether it would be right for us to lock the film without really commenting on what's happening now. And then we have a film in advanced development with Screen Scotland, which is a UK, Italian, South African co-production. Of course, UK and Italy are probably like two of the most um, hit countries, but we are still in the advanced stages of development. We had to cancel the recce because we couldn't travel to Italy. And now we're sort of waiting for the Italian government to open up so we know exactly what's going on with the tax credits. We wanted to film that in the last quarter of this year, but we're now sort of just decided to wait until 2021 and hopefully maybe the first quarter of 2021. But I think what that did for us, what it gave, it gave us more time in development. And the producers are now talking a lot more frequently than we used to because we sort of have to strategize what's going to happen with insurance. Are we going to be able to persuade actors to go to Italy? And, and all of that um, thing. So we're still sort of looking at that. But I think um, for us, it's been really good because we've just been able to just take some more time to just plan a bit. And we're working with the Film Commission in Apulia and Screen Scotland, and they've been really supportive. Um, the other project is we have a co-production with um, the States, which we're not planning on doing until next year anyway. So it's just giving us more time to focus on the storytelling and the writing. And we are also doing a second film with South Africa. We can't do a recce at the moment, but again, it just means we have more time to work on those scripts. And how do you find it working with South Africa? Because there have been some UK, um, South Africa co-productions that have been you know, really well done. Um, is, do you find that an easy relationship with their systems? I do. I think I have a very good South African producer. He's very experienced on ground. So, and of course, the Film Commission in KwaZulu-Natal has been very proactive in forging relationships with the UK. So we've been to South Africa twice in the past 12 months, and they've kind of really held our hand around the system. And because they're quite keen to forge relationships with UK producers, to be honest, I think we've had a very easy time navigating the system and making sure things can be um, compatible and now other regions in South Africa are now opening up so KwaZulu-Natal is no longer the only option if you want to film in South Africa but we've been very lucky because our co-producer has been quite good. And how, how did you meet those South African partners? Did you meet them? Did you go to South Africa first or did you meet them in Cannes one year or London Film Festival? Or where do you find the right partners? I met them in Cannes actually because the South African um, pavilion used to be next to the UK pavilion 
and they also used to have really good parties. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty much where I met all of them. And that's even where I met Jackie from the KwaZulu Natal Film Commission. And so, and I know she had this um, intention and this desire to work with the UK because she had been talking about it for a very long time. I think I first met her five years ago. And then about three years ago, she sort of set up the, um, the mission to South Africa for UK producers. And so when we went to South Africa, we were then able to build on those relationships that we had developed in Cannes and discuss projects then more seriously. And quite a few um, co-productions have been put together from that um, trade mission. Yeah, that, that's a wonderful success story that you do a sort of trade trip and then it results in real collaborations and films. Yes. So let's get more of those done. Thank you, Victoria. I think we'll come back to you with some questions. I'm gonna um, flip over to Claudia. Um, so Claudia, uh, one of your UK co-productions was on High Life, the mm -hmm. amazing Claire Denis film. Um, Thank you. you don't have to be as positive as Matthew, um, but how did you find it You know, working with, with the UK on that one? And do you see the potential for more collaborations? Yeah, um, it was a minority UK co-production, so it was very easy working together. Uh, and again, I think as we probably all know, it really depends on the partner you have in the country. If you're having a good uh, co-producer, uh, you all have the same kind of common sense of how to make the film, um, then it it works. You know, I think it's the main the main thing. Um, no, it was it was very clear, very straightforward. Um, very easy. What I find when I'm talking um, under the times of um, of the coronavirus, what for it becomes very visible. Say, governments when I do a co-production, and I have different crew as we had on High Life. I had um, UK actors, UK crew. I had you. Oh, Claudia, you're breaking up a little bit. I'm not sure what we can do about that. Ah, sorry, sorry. And on, on the Corona times, I'm seeing, for example, in Germany, the government, they came in very quickly. And for example, the German crew, uh, immediately we have something which called short time work. So you're getting 60%, even if you're not working, actually for a whole year, you would, the government would pay you. So when I'm doing a co-production, what happens is that maybe some of the crew because they are employed in the uk they don't get anything or they get their co contract gets cancelled because that's the law and then the german and the french crew or actors they're getting very high support so um, when we're now talking about our current productions is something we feel we have to get around with it's not so easy um, and especially in these days when you're starting a new film and and a new co-production I cannot really, it's difficult because you have to ha have the spendings, but on the other side, I cannot have actors being completely with no security. And then I have actors who are completely secured. So we haven't really found a solution on that, actually. And this is a big difference between UK and I feel mainland Europe, you know. Um, also regarding insurance issues, um, now I think a lot of European, like mainland European countries, um, the government is taking that part um, that we have an emergency fund in case you're starting now a new film and um, but we have big discussions how to handle in case of a co-production so are there only in our case the german costs are uh, covered what happens with english costs or american costs so it's something we're figuring out unfortunately of course, politically, it's very national these days, you know, each country is thinking of their own people and their own costs. So that's something very concrete we've, we are thinking and facing at the moment with uh, co-productions. Yeah, thank you for mentioning all that. Um, and certainly I'm not an expert on um, the UK government assistance, but I know some film workers have been put on furlough. So I think yeah. they get up to 80% of salary for now, that switches over in August. Some can apply for self-employed relief, but some people fall through that, those cracks, um, for sure. But um, just to say, people can check in their local guidelines. But yeah, you're absolutely right that every country has different ways of helping their people right now. And it does feel sort of, you know, quite national, even in film, like there's um, emergency funding, but that's 
you know, probably less for co-productions, I guess. Um, and it's more to keep the local industry alive. Of course, one way to do keep the local industry alive is to have them making international co-productions. So hopefully On the other side, uh, you're seeing now uh, before the Cannes market, I think we all got these emails of how the tax rebate in each country gets higher and higher. So I think there's maybe some movement you want to have foreigners come in your country <laughs> and, and, and shoot and, and spending money and of course doing co-productions, yeah. And what, what are you, what projects are you working on right now? Are you finding you can go ahead or do you have to sort of pull? Yeah, I mean, we we had uh, luck. We had one big German Czech film, um, majority German film, and co-production. Luckily, and then we had one film we had to stop uh, a, Czech, um, a Swiss German co-production. Um, and actually, we green lighted now. Um, that's why I'm very emotional about should we now plan films which we shoot in September. But we actually did green light this week. Um, Uh, quite a big film from a German director. Um, it's a German-French co-production. Um, and we feel also a little bit a responsibility. Uh, we don't know how long this is going to last, the crisis. And we do get a lot of support, I think, in Europe from our governments, from our fundings. And people are like, we do feel also responsibility if we're getting something financed that we should go ahead and we should take the risk and we should, what can we do? Should we sit at home for, for two, three years and do nothing? So we feel, of course, under all, all measurements, uh, yeah, this is a new situation. Um, we've been, uh, it, was, it was good, like Fionola said that, we are used to, uh, for each film, we have different problems. So we feel, yeah, we should also, we have to take the risk and we have to continue making films and finding ways how we now doing films, also in co-production, not only local films. Wonderful to hear and congrats on a green light for September. Good luck. <laughs> um, we're going to finally come to Marlene um, and just wondering, same kind of question, what, what are the projects you're working on now, how, how is, does it feel harder to cross borders and like I said you're smart enough to also be working in animation which everybody's envious of because there's no production shutdown, well maybe some amendments but not, not a shutdown so please tell us what things are like in your world. Yeah, well, I think I was lucky enough uh, 10 years ago when I founded my company, Viking Film, that, I, um, that I, I was already working with a stop motion animation director that I, I really admired. And uh, during the years, we made several short films and then uh, we were developing our feature film together. And because this is such a timely and costly process, we decided it may, might be a good idea to... Uh, to buy some property to make uh, a stop motion studio in. So last year we bought a very old garage in the east of the Netherlands uh, and we totally rebuilt it into an animation studio. And it opened uh, March 12, a day before the, the lockdown. Um, and I was really uh, uh, very scared at that moment because I thought, okay, we are opening and one day later I'm closing. <laughs> Um, and and I've, what I found very interesting this last couple of weeks is that um, I included a lot of the people who are working in the studio in the decision what we should do. And I knew that in the end I was the one making the decision, but I also felt that you are as strong as the people who has the most fear, I think. So um, I really listened very closely to everyone and, and spoke. And, and I think a lot of time went into this. Every week uh, I was there talking. And, so at first we made the decision, okay, we will continue for a week and we will see how it works. Uh, we will keep the one and a half meter distance. We will clean uh, as crazy. We will. So uh, also immediately I noticed that it, it took us much more time. But luckily also in the Netherlands, the, the, the Netherlands Film Fund is really supportive and we could immediately apply for a bit more money because we were delaying. Um, and now after, well, three months, I feel that finally we have a kind of okay rhythm. And last week was the first week that I didn't have to go there to talk about COVID. <laughs> so, but it, it is very intense because you have to deal with fears and emotions and 
Um, and yeah, that's something we, we do a lot, of course, but, but these are fears on a, on a much more uh, life and death way. Uh, uh, one of the people working in the studio had a baby of, of six months old and not really someone to cover if he and his wife would become ill. And, you know, so you ha really have to think about those things. And um, no, but I think we, uh, I included a lot of the people and that really worked. And then I was also working on a, on a computer animated series and that was quite easy because we just moved everyone to their houses. And, but we started that animation on March 9. So I have no idea if we are quicker or slower working from home. It's just, yeah, it's just how it is. Um, yeah, but, but that was very good. And then I, I think I was lucky enough to be with a lot of projects in development and financing. So I'm using uh, my other time to work on, on Sasha Pollack's films uh, that are set in the UK. Um, but I think it, it's very good in the States. What we are in, we can really use this year and, and, and beginning of next year to finance it and to, to further develop it. Uh, my first response with that films was, okay, we're not going to shoot anything this year. Sasha asked me after a week already, how are we going to shoot in the one and a half meter society? And I, I answered, not, <laughs> because I, I just didn't see it. And I felt very vulnerable that we had uh, no insurance, of course. That is, uh, that, that is something that makes uh, our job even harder and, mm. and makes us more vulnerable than we already are, I think. So... But also here, the Netherlands Film Fund is stepping up on that and they are kind of taking over the position of the insurer uh, so that we can continue shooting. And I think we are now slowly starting again in the Netherlands, which I, I feel is very good. Great to hear. Um, I should mention, you know, the BFI has got measures to support UK filmmakers during COVID <clears throat> times. I don't know the detail of those, but you could look at the BFI website. Um, but like for Sasha's films, I mean, had you planned on shooting for sure this year? Well, uh, um, one of the films that is like the most far advanced, it's called Silver Haze. And it's, uh, it's a quite experimental film. So um, uh, it's again with the, with the leading actress of, of Dirty God playing the main part. And it's the story of her life. So we wanted to make it also in a very experimental way without a script, uh, only a step outline and shoot in, in like four different periods uh, in time and in between edit to see if we have what we want. So it is funny enough a film that I think we can easily, more easily start shooting because we also will make it with a very small crew, mm -hmm. uh, maybe eight people. Um, so yeah, we, we would have liked to start this year, but, but I'm now waiting a little bit to see what happens and I don't want to jeopardize anyone. And, and Vicky, the, the main actress, she is a, uh, in her, her non-actress life, she is a healthcare assistant because oh. we, we casted her from that job. So she had to work a lot. She has been for three months in lockdown in the hospital where she worked. And she worked on, the, on, the, on a lot of COVID patients. Oh. Uh, so that was also important for her, of course, to, to do that job. And, and we are now thinking if and how we can make room in the film to tell that story as well, uh, knowing that when we are there in a year, maybe no one is even interested anymore in, in hearing COVID stories, but, but we feel because it's such an important part of Vicky's life that we should incorporate it somehow. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. But also like you could, you know, a production of that size, you could see how you could make that safer, easier than, you know, I was talking to a Norwegian yesterday who's doing a big war epic with, you know, 500 extras, and they just can't do that this year. So, yeah, hopefully you can. Oh, yeah, sometimes you, I think a lot of it in our jobs depends on luck. So uh, I, I feel I'm, I'm very lucky that the position where I'm in this year, it could have been very different. I could have also been in the middle of a shoot and, and breaking things down. And, and, and I, 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 I feel very sad for the people who are suffering so much. It's really uh, horrific. And I really, I think what is now, uh, now our local uh, film institutes, they can now really mean something and they can step up and say, we are going to, to guarantee you that you are insured. And, and I think, yeah, you are very right that it's, it's more nationalistic, mm. uh, but, but we can also really support our, our local government and film funds to, uh, to step up, I think. Great. We are getting um, some great questions from the audience. So thanks to everybody who has been asking questions. And I think I'd love to 
open this up to everybody now. Um, unsurprisingly, <laughs> we really should do an insurance uh, webinar, I think. But a lot of people are asking about insurance. And um, Mike, do you know the name of the company that offered that COVID insurance? No, no, I don't. And I don't want to get into something I don't know yeah, I think, everything about. Yeah, I think that's a smart man. Um, but I, what I could comment on that, because I think it might be the case that Mike already had that insurance long time ago, yeah. uh, because that is also with my productions. I, I am also COVID insured on that because it was in this, but now no one, nowhere in the world, uh, no insurance company will insure COVID. Yeah, absolutely, Marlene. We, we took the insurance out last year, so yeah. Okay. Um, and I just, somebody, I think it was the a Danish, no, it was a Norwegian yesterday who told me um, hiccups. I think based in the UK, they had already an existing policy for them and had updated it. So that's one. But yeah, I, I think it could be quite tricky getting new insurance. People are definitely figuring that out because, you know, one person is just point blank asked, how can you make a film if you can't insure it? Yeah, that's why I think for us, it's important for all countries that the government has to step in uh, with uh, like an insurance kind of a fund. And mm -hmm. I think that's what we all in our countries are lobbying for, uh, because we, we feel we all hope we want to be positive. Um, we all hope it's money they have to put in place. We hopefully don't need to use. <laughs> So, uh, we, so we're trying to tell them it's a, it's a very, it's the cheapest support you can give us. We don't want the money now. We just want to have it in place if something like a march is going to happen. And I think in a lot of countries, uh, France, uh, Austria, I think Netherlands, Germany, we, it's all, and UK, I, I'm sure they also, I don't know how in the UK, how the discussions are there, but we are we are pretty much forward. Like in Germany, in July, we will have a, an insurance governmental fund in, in place who will probably cover this. They will cover up to 30% in discussion of the entire budget, which our feeling is is enough uh, just for uh, for Corona um, damages. Um, and then in, in addition to an existing uh, production insurance. So. Okay, great. Um, we've got a question um, from my producer friend Kate Separovich in Australia, who worked on dirt music with Finola, I believe. And she's just asking, you know, where are, where's the future in co-productions as borders might stay closed or reclose if there's another wave? Um, any thoughts on that? Finola. I mean, I, I wanted to say oh, something. Sorry. I'm, I'm experienced. Sorry, I'm experienced. Maybe we've been in a lucky island, but uh, in Europe, we felt it was not impossible to travel. So for business trips, um, I'm not talking Italy and Spain. That was all closed. But on business trips, uh, it was possible to travel. So I have to say, we continued castings. We did small shoots. It it wasn't. Uh, if you're doing like a smaller film or documentary, I think things are things being possible and things are possible and lightening up. We're quite positive it's gonna gonna be soon very, very uh, much better. Okay. Yeah, and I, I basically feel the same as that. And um, I mean, you know, no one knows right really, but I think um, all the signs are uh, as are good, and I think we just sort of proceed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know, for, for instance, um, in Iceland, they reopened the borders on June 15th and you get a test when you land. If you've got it, you go to a special hotel. If you don't have it, you go tour some glaciers, you know. Um, so that's, but they are also, as we know, a smaller country able to manage it a bit better. I mean, Matthew, I assume, it, or I don't know, maybe I don't assume, um, are the borders open in New Zealand for visitors? No. <clears throat> Do you want to stay safe? Currently, current, currently New Zealand uh, has a closed border. The only people that are allowed into New Zealand at the moment are New Zealand citizens mm -hmm. or permanent residents. And all people who arrive in New Zealand uh, at this time, regardless of their status, have to go into managed isolation for 14 days and have two tests along the way. Yeah. So um, uh, like Australia, our border is very strict at the moment. Yeah. And Matthew, I've got a specific question here from somebody in the audience asking, you know, how do you approach a, like a UK co-production right now when borders are closed? Does that shape 
the kind of project you might develop or are you, you know, would you look more at documentaries or animation right now? Look, it's, it's a really good question. And in some ways I have to come back to what I said before. I personally am in the fortunate position in that I traveled an enormous amount over the last few years. And I've, I've been working with the UK for, for 20 years now. And it's those relationships that at this time um, where we, we start um, production on a film, a UK co-production next week, in fact. Um, we've closed over this process and we've been able to do that because of long relationships where there's trust. And we we're able to speak to each other and just say, look, hey, what do you need? What do we need? How do we do this? Is that um, shooting in the UK or New Zealand? That's shooting um, in both, actually. Okay. So um, that's um, it, it's been an interesting process. So I won't lie, but it's been it's, it's been a great learning process. And um, again, you come back to the importance of relationships. Uh, I always say, co-productions are about relationships. They're about trust. They're about getting to know people, and they're also about. And I must emphasize this. Uh, it's not enough in a co-production just to find a great partner in another country, although that's obviously important. You equally have to know and understand that country. You know, uh, co-production should be mutually beneficial. So when other people ask me, I always say, well, look, if you're working with France or Germany or England, it's important to, to have an appreciation of that country and their culture and, and want to work with them. Um, makes it a lot smoother. Great. Um, we've got two questions that are kind of related, I think. One from Deepti Chalwa and one from Ishan Mahapatra. Um, they're wondering about, you know, this, for instance, this week in Cannes, are you doing meetings in the same way you would? Are you meeting new people? Um, if you're sort of new to this type of introductions, is it possible to meet the right people just talking online at first? Look, um, everyone's experience will obviously be different depending on who it is. But it, for, for me right now, um, I've really been leaning into prior relationships and uh, respecting those relationships and, and making sure that, that the work we can do together is beneficial for both parties. You know, I come back to, in some ways, the fundamentals. Your, a production will advance when it's in the interest of everyone involved. Um, so if you want to be a good partner, you've got to make it your business to know what your partners need and what their interests are and, and what they're hoping to gain. Um, and I think at this point in time, we've heard from everyone on this uh, session, everyone's having a hard time. I don't think anyone's having a, a, a great time. Everyone's challenging, solving problems like they've never solved before. Um, so I think it's really a time to value, personally that is, the relationships you've got and let those people that you work with a lot know that you, you care about them. They're not just a, a means to cut a check. Yeah. They're a human being. Um, and they've got problems as well. And if you can lean into those and you can further the relationships, that's got to help you in the future as well. Yeah. Everybody else, Victoria, for instance, with your South African partners, are you talking in a different way and chiming in? Yeah. I mean, because we've also developed a friendship as well. So I think, I mean, just like uh, Matthew said, it's really trying to support each other and just figure out what we both need to be able to just get through this period and try as much as we can to future proof. Because I don't think anybody really knows what the future holds. You know, this could, we could be sort of um, getting to the end of the chaos. We could also just be, it, it could also be the start of the new or known. We have no idea what's coming up. So we're talking quite regularly and we're supporting each other because we're also walking across a slate of projects and just sort of trying to see how best we can get through this phase. We're fortunate in the sense that personally, none of us have been affected by the virus and our families are okay. We all have our jobs. So that, that gives us the headspace to sort of really try and strategize. But that's really all we're doing at the moment is coming up with plan A to Z <laughs> so that when things do open up, we can be as agile as we possibly can working in these sort of circumstances. Great. And, and for the rest of you, are, are you meeting new people during this time? Are you sticking to people you know? A bit of both? Marlene, are you talking to new people? Or are you just <laughs> trying Always. to tell everything? No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. no, I think you, you rely a lot on what you, what you know now. And, um, um, and because it's also much more on a personal level, I think uh, 
that's always a bit how how I work, and now it's more even more like that. I, I think, and no, I'm I'm uh, I'm very happy that I'm I'm working a lot with people that I already worked with before because when you now go on set, um, things will be will be much more complicated than than they have ever been, and and then it's it's even more important that you work with people that you trust and that you. Um, and that you can rely on and that that you know will also uh, follow the rules because there will be much more rules and restrictions and and I think that is that is very important um, uh, that that we keep a close eye on each other and that we we cherish each other and each other's needs and fears so yeah I think especially that trust you're right you have to trust your co-producer anyway for so many reasons but now especially to trust them to handle things that you would like you would to handle new safety rules, to handle, you know, regulations and things. Yeah. Um, we've kind of, oh, Claudia. No, I, I just wanted to be honest. I think uh, this whole Zoom video thing, it's fine to get things done and it's a little alternative, but I think we all are sure we, hopefully we're all going to be in Cannes next year and meeting in person and and it's not really possible to meet someone new like uh, on on a zoom or whatever company video conference meeting I mean that's for sure yeah okay thank you yes I hope we're back together in the UK tent with some sunshine next year uh, we've had a question in from Ronya Mann who's asking has anybody ever worked between in the UK and Nigeria and I will just answer firstly that I think there was a UK Nigerian co-production called Half a Yellow Sun and I think it was Andrea Calderwood who produced that um, and then last year um, on a smaller scale really great film called The Last Tree which Shola Amu um, directed I don't know if that was an official UK Nigeria co-production but um, I know that film did really well um, and you know shot in both places and a really wonderful film does anybody else, anybody else ever worked with Nigeria? Obviously it's the booming film industry there, Victoria? Yes, I have. I mean, I had a film that was at um, LFF last year, Walking with Shadows, which was a UK Nigeria co-production, but it was unofficial because there's no treaty. Yeah. Nigeria. And how was it working with Nigeria? You gotta have generators. That's what I learned when I went to Nigeria. The power goes out. You gotta have your Niger generator backups ready for the shoot. And you also have to, you need to have the wires for the generators to be so far that it does not affect the, the sound. Yeah, and, oh yeah, that too, yeah. So, I mean, with working with Shadows, for example, there we had to do a lot of ADR in post because sound is still an issue in Nigeria, quite simply because it's a very, Lagos especially, it's a very noisy city and it's quite difficult to get things shut down. Part of um, Born in New York was shot in Lagos because we also look at the Afrobeat scene and how it's influencing Africans in the diaspora. And, you know, with, there's no real infrastructure in, in Nigeria. It can be a bit of a jungle. The, the only way you're going to survive is to have really strong people on ground. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you need to know the right local people because they can get things done. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's a great place to work because people are very entrepreneurial and they're ready to get things done, you know, in a quarter of the time that we take to do it for a lot less. But you, you, can, you have to be really agile and entrepreneurial and just be prepared to adapt. You know, when we were shooting Bonnie New York last year, there was a point when we, the crew, was surrounded by area boys who wanted to take all the kits and stuff. So it, it's all of the sort of things that you sort of need to factor in for you're always dealing with something unknown. But of course, the story, there's so many great stories there and there's so many um, great people. But I work with Nigeria a lot. The film that we're doing with Italy and South Africa is actually set in Nigeria, but we're recreating um, Lagos in South Africa, partly because there's no treaty and we have to finance the film somehow. And of course, UK and um, South Africa are so much more compatible because of the treaties and incentives, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So good luck to whoever is planning um, to work with Nigeria and the UK. Sounds exciting. Um, I think we'll start wrapping up. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, look, you know, this year has been an absolute mess for a lot of people. There's been tragedy. You know, I don't want to lessen that, but are, are there any silver linings about the way we've been working this year, have you found yourself being very collaborative? You know, you're getting to know your, um, your co-producers uh, Zoom apartments and if they have a cat or not. Um, but seriously, you know, have there been ways of working this year that 
you want to embrace going forward? Maybe more development time. Well, I, I could elaborate on that. I, uh, I'm this year part of Inside Pictures. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was a bit reluctant to apply because then it was already uh, in the midst of COVID. And I thought, hmm, is this really the best? But, but what I like is that we all applied with knowing that. Uh, and I see everyone uh, also about meeting new people. Everyone is putting so much effort in to really get to know each other. And it's very intense, of course, being uh, from 10 to, uh, to 8 behind Zoom. And, and, but I, I'm really happy with it because it, it gives me the feeling that I'm also still part of the world and that, that I'm also doing something new and, and exciting. And I'm really happy uh, with that. That's really my silver lining of this year. <laughs> So those are new people you've met. Good. Online. Okay. Anybody else? The, who was it that mentioned you, Victoria? Didn't you say you, you've got more time to consider and develop and that's been good? Yes. And I'm also doing the EV this year as well. And we, we were lucky to have the first workshop in, um, in Luxembourg the week when the world was shutting down. Wow. And second workshop we just did um, last week on Zoom. But what came out of that was we, of course, we had a WhatsApp group and we've sort of become like a very strong peer support group. And I think our relationships have kind of like really deepened over this period because we're sort of all in it together and we're all sort of at a very similar stage in our careers and sort of trying to navigate this together. But I think even on a personal level, I find that I have developed much deeper relationships with both family and friends. There's so much more time now to connect with people, reaching out to people. And I think that's definitely one thing I would love to continue because you know, it really allowed me to slow down and focus on what's important. And that's really at the end of the day, the relationships, whether with family or friends or colleagues. Yeah, I have to say I've I've enjoyed flying less. My goodness, who knew what it was like to be home all the time? It's like a different world, but still connected somehow. Uh, Mike or Matthew, Mike. I, you know, I'm not so positive because although, you know, Zoom has changed the way we do business. I sort of want to second what Claudia says. I think this business is all about looking in somebody's eyes and the chemistry in a room. You know, I did some um, TV um, pitching the other day pitching a project to, to TV commissioners and it was it was so stilted and technologically challenged and sort of lame to be honest you know not to mention the fact that you know and from my sales days I can say that when you're in a room with people um, and you're pitching a project or you're negotiating it's a much more compelling experience and it's much more powerful than if you're doing it on zoom so this business I think is about personal relationships it always has been from the very start of cinema and I I long for the days when we're back to that and I miss traveling I hate to say it but no you know I miss I miss being too. in other countries yeah um and yeah that international outlook and understanding comes sometimes from meeting people where they live not just on a computer um Mike if Venice happens will you go I have booked my hotel and flights so yes I'm very excited um, I'm trying not to overthink it. Um, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm desperate to get back to, to movies. Having said that, and I have to applaud the Cannes market because I watched a couple of films yesterday, um, Cannes label films, which were outstanding films. Mm. Um, yes, I would have preferred to see them in a big screen, obviously, but um, what they've pulled together so quickly is incredible. Yeah, well done, Cannes, Marche, for having us here. Magically. Um, anybody have other thoughts of Silver Linings, Finola? Oh, just unmute yourself. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, change creates opportunity, I think, and you have to just think about it like that. And I, and also it's this sort of, there's been a lot of slowing down because we're not traveling, we're not going to the theater. I mean, I've never spent so much time in my house ever and I'm yeah it's and the weather has been sensational so it's like what's not to like if we had headed into winter in this pandemic in the UK I think it would have been miserable mm. so I think you know a lot of you know my friends and colleagues it's just trying to enjoy you know those upsides as well but I agree with Mike I mean we're we're in the interaction business and there's nothing like just yeah sitting one-on-one -on -one. I mean I've, I've had some good you know, some good Zooms for, for sure where you go, it's not that much different. And I think if you're pitching to people that you already know, in my experience at this time, that's a big difference from, you know, just pitching to people you've never met before or don't really know. That's, 
because if you've already met them, then uh, then that's you've already established you know that relationship, which goes back to what Matt says. But um, yeah, I think it's just making you know making the most of it. But sure, I'm looking forward to getting on those planes and you know again as well. Right. Well, maybe we'll we'll see you all in Cannes next year for sure. I think we owe you all a real glass of wine, not just one on Zoom. Um, thank you to everybody. Thanks so much to our speakers for being so honest and forthright and for, you know, hats off to any film producer. Um, you make miracles happen, especially right now. Um, if anybody missed the part of the talk, it will be archived on weareukfilm.com um, later this week, maybe even tomorrow. Uh, and just to remind you, we have two more UK film webinars coming up. Tomorrow, we're offering advice for shorts filmmakers. And then on Thursday, we're going to talk about how production will resume in the UK. So I think those can be both very useful um, for those audiences. Um, but thank you to our speakers. Thank you for the audience who joined us. Sorry, we didn't get to all your questions. We had, you know, 30 something questions, I think. Amazing. Um, and good luck, everybody, and stay safe. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks.